Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Professor Andres Vilindovsky, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics in the University of Lincoln. I welcome you uh, to our next uh, uh, lecture as part of uh, uh, Lincoln Mathematics and Physics uh, Week, uh, which is in turn in part of British uh, Science Week uh, 2021. Uh, I'll just uh, mention to you that uh, we uh, first start with a short presentation uh, uh, about uh, uh, our school and university which hosts these lectures. And if you visit uh, uh, every lecture, you will uh, hear this uh, several times. So by the end of the week, you, uh, you can pass exam on, uh, on this subject. Uh, after that, there uh, will be a lecture and you can ask uh, questions. Uh, 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 in two uh, ways. You can uh, place them in a live chat of uh, uh, YouTube, or you can pay, uh, place anonymous questions in a Padlet link, uh, which you have in your uh, registration emails uh, from Eventbrite, or uh, we will also put it uh, link in a live uh, uh, chat of YouTube, so you can click there and whatever you wish, or you place your question in uh, YouTube live chat, or you place it anonymously in uh, 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 in uh, Padlet. Uh, and now uh, I'll just uh, tell a few words uh, about uh, uh, our uh, school and university. Hello, everyone. I'm Professor Andres Vilendowski, Head of School of Mathematics and Physics at the University of Lincoln, which hosts uh, Lincoln Mass and Physics Week 2021. Uh, this week uh, forms a part of uh, uh, British Science Week, which runs also the same dates. Uh, this year we have uh, our um, events, uh, lectures, all online. Uh, traditionally, in previous years, uh, you would come to our public lectures to our lovely campus uh, uh, by the uh, Brayford Pool, by Waterfront. This is how campus looks uh, in the evening. Uh, but today we, uh, we do it online, uh, and in my introduction, I just would like to give you a few words about uh, uh, our uh, uh, university and a school which organizes these uh, uh, lectures. Lincoln is a, a small city for approximately uh, 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, our university is uh, uh, right next to the center, just about 10 minutes uh, walk. city itself is quite old. It was already found by Romans uh, soon after they came to the British Isles. Uh, once it was also a uh, base of famous Legion 9 Hispania before Legionists moved to uh, uh, to York. Uh, the city received quite early uh, in 86 uh, prestigious status of a colonia. Uh, so it became Lindum Colonia and Lincoln name came later on. And uh, that already happened in times of Emperor Domitian. Uh, the place uh, <clears throat> had a forum and a bath and uh, all uh, facilities uh, of Roman times and was a, a place for uh, retired uh, uh, legionaries. Uh, even today, you still can find uh, remains, Roman remains, and you can walk or drive under this uh, uh, Roman arch of uh, Roman gates. The only one in Britain through which uh, traffic is still allowed. Next big step in Lincoln development uh, was in times of another visitors. Then William the Conqueror, William the First, uh, uh, came to British Isles. Uh, very soon, he ordered to build a, a famous uh, Lincoln Castle on the top of Lincoln Hill. And uh, uh, some years later, uh, also even more famous Lincoln Cathedral uh, started to be built uh, just opposite to Lincoln Palace. 
Uh, this cathedral is considered to be uh, one of the uh, most beautiful building, if not the most beautiful cathedral uh, in Britain and probably uh, around the world. Uh, for some period of time, that was in fact the tallest building on the planet uh, when a uh, wooden spire was uh, uh, on the top of a main tower. A uh, cathedral uh, is, of course, uh, was a seat of uh, learning already from Middle Ages. However, university appeared in Lincoln uh, much later, in the end of the uh, 20th century. A uh, campus uh, by the waterfront was opened uh, by Her Majesty the Queen. And uh, uh, much later, already in the 21st century, uh, College of Science was open, which included School of Mathematics and Physics, uh, which opened its doors in 2014. And three years later, we also opened our own building, which we share with Schools of Engineering and School of Computer Science. And just in about months, we will be celebrating four years of this beautiful Isaac Newton building, named after Isaac Newton, a gentleman who also uh, comes from Lincolnshire. And uh, our lectures are primarily aimed at those who study mathematics or physics at A-levels, because they're accessible to everyone who is curious <clears throat> about maths and physics. Uh, but maybe those who study a math and physical level will think about continuing the education after the school. And therefore, I'll mention what our school has here on offer uh, regarding degrees in math and physics. As you see, we have full range of degrees, uh, bachelor, three years degree, and integrated master's both in mathematics and in physics. Uh, we have also various combinations, uh, for instance, combination of uh, <clears throat> another Asian subject, uh, one of the most Asian subject, philosophy. So we have a uh, degree in mathematics with philosophy and physics with philosophy, where philosophy is a minor component and physics or math are major components. And we have also a combination of mathematics and computer science, and mixture of mathematics and physics as well. And with that, I welcome you to our uh, uh, next event in Lincoln Mars and Physics Week 2021. And I hope you will enjoy it. Welcome. And uh, uh, now I would like uh, to welcome you to our main part, uh, which will be talked by our uh, uh, speaker of this afternoon, uh, Dr. Martin Greenall, whom I am uh, very happy to welcome here together with us. Hello, Martin. Hi, Andre. Hello, everyone. So I'll just uh, say a few words. Uh, uh, Dr. Martin Greenell is a senior lecturer in our School of Mathematics and Physics, and also he is a school senior tutor in mathematics. Uh, Martin obtained his doctorate degree, so-called PhD, uh, from Department of Mathematics at Imperial College London. Uh, then he spent uh, several years working on various research positions in University of Edinburgh, Leeds, here in the UK, as well as uh, in uh, a famous German research center in the city Yuli. And after that, he received a, a personal European Union Marie Curie a fellowship and spent research time in Strasbourg, France. Uh, uh, after that, he came back to uh, United Kingdom and in 2013 uh, uh, became a lecturer at the University of Aberystwyth in Wales. And in 2015, he joined our school here in Lincoln. And I'm very happy to give the floor now to Martin uh, for his lecture, 
and you are welcome to type in your questions at any moment of time as lecture goes in live chat of uh, uh, YouTube or in a Padlet link which already appeared in a live chat uh, of YouTube as well. Let's enjoy the lecture. Hello, my name is Martin Greenall. I'm one of the maths lecturers at the University of Lincoln. And in addition to teaching maths, I also deal with employability and with admissions for the School of Maths and Physics. And if you do have any questions on those subjects or on the talk itself, then feel free to get in touch on the email address that's on your screen now. And the talk is going to cover the topic of optimization. I'd like to begin by giving an overview of the content of the talk and I'll begin by introducing the concept of optimization, both in general terms and in more mathematical terms as well. And optimization often concerns finding a maximum or finding a minimum point. And the simplest case of that is to walk along a single line and find the maximum and minimum point of that, find the highest and the lowest point. But even in that relatively simple case, it's often not possible to solve the problem completely by hand. We have to do it using a computer numerically. And I'll outline a brief algorithm, a recipe that will help us to solve that kind of problem using a computer, should we wish to do so. Once we've dealt with the case of maximization and minimization along a single line, we'll go on to the more general case of a surface, and we'll think about finding maximum and minimum points of that surface and another kind of feature that a surface can have as well. Once we've dealt with the case of a surface, we'll move on and we'll think about what are called the global maximum and minimum points. The global maximum is the highest point you can possibly get to, and the global minimum, similarly, is the lowest point you can possibly get to. And knowing whether or not you've found the global maximum or minimum is one of the big questions in optimization, and I'll discuss some of the implications of that for applications as well. The final concept that I'd like to introduce is the idea of a constraint, and this is a restriction on how far we can go in the maximization or minimization procedure. And in the final section, I'll draw those concepts together and we'll see how they were used by one of our third year students in a project that was done in collaboration with a company which was designing an electrical component called a waveguide. In general terms, optimization is finding the best solution among all the solutions that are available to us, among, as we sometimes say, all the feasible solutions. And what that means often in mathematical terms is that you're finding a maximum or a minimum value. And if you are thinking about an economic problem, you might be wanting to find the maximum value of the profit and the minimum value of the costs. In general terms, optimization is finding the best solution that we can among the possible solutions. And mathematically, it's finding a maximum or a minimum. The simplest possible case of finding maxima and minima is to walk along a line as we have here and find the maximum and minimum points as we move along it. And we can think about walking along this line from the left hand side, reaching a maximum up here, then we drop away from that, we fall down to the right hand side and we start to climb once we've passed this minimum over in the bottom right. And the way that we locate these maximum and minimum points is by finding when the graph changes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa in the case of the minimum from decreasing to increasing. And when a graph changes from increasing to decreasing, its slope at this peak here passes through zero. And similarly, when a graph changes from decreasing to increasing, there's a point here when its slope passes through zero. And the way that you would locate those maximum and minimum points mathematically is to find the values of x at which the tangent to the graph, this line drawn with respect to the graph like this, becomes flat and the slope of the graph is zero. And you would then find those points and classify them as being maxima or minima respectively. And in many cases, that's a calculation that you can do by hand, but in some cases with more complicated functions, it's not possible to do so. And over the next few slides, I'm going to introduce a technique that we can use on a computer in order to find maximum and minimum points. 
What we're going to imagine here is that we've worked out the value of this function. We've worked out the value of y at three different values of x. And what we've found is that the value of y at the middle of those three points is below the value of y at the outer two points. And if we've got a set of three points like this, then we've located a minimum and we know more specifically that that minimum lies in between these outer lines here, these dotted lines. We say that we've bracketed the minimum in between these two outer lines. We've got three points. The middle point lies below the two outer points. We've found the location of the minimum, but we haven't found it accurately. We've for the present bracketed it between these two outer points here. To home in on this minimum point and to find its location more accurately, we're going to proceed as follows. And what we're going to do is work out the value of the function, work out the value of y at one more point. And that's the point that's appeared in blue here. And what we can now see is that we've got a new set of three points where the middle point lies below the outer two. And that is these three points over on the left of our figure here. We've got one point over on the left, another over on the right of the left hand side of our figure, and then this point here lies below the two outer points. And that now gives us a new bracket, a new interval within which the minimum must lie, and we can move on by highlighting those three points in red. Once we've highlighted those three points in red and worked out that the minimum has to lie between the outer of the two red points, we can discard the points that we've got on the right hand side of the graph, the black point, and then zoom in on the minimum a little bit further. And we've now found the minimum more accurately than we did before, and it's now bracketed between these two vertical lines, and we can mark that we've bracketed the minimum in between the vertical lines marked on the graph here. We've homed in on the minimum like this. We say that it's bracketed between two points and it's now bracketed between two points that are closer together than it was before and it's located more accurately than it was before. And we can continue this procedure for as long as we like until we've homed in on the minimum to the accuracy that we want. question that you might have asked yourself is how did we choose the point that we evaluated the function at? How did we choose the location of that fourth point? And the distance of that fourth point into the interval is actually related to another concept from maths that's called the golden ratio. And the golden ratio is formed by drawing a square that we have on the left hand side of this figure here and we then draw a rectangle on the right hand side of that square, in this case, such that the ratios of the various sides satisfies the following property. We've got A plus B, which is marked in green. And if that is divided by A, which is marked in red, then that is equal to A divided by B. And this golden ratio actually appears in the algorithm in the recipe that we've just outlined. The reciprocal or one over this golden ratio is the fraction into the interval that we should choose the point in order to make this algorithm as efficient as possible and make it go towards the final solution as efficiently as possible. So there's a piece of mathematics here that appears very, very abstract and appears very distant from the application that we're currently doing. But this idea of the golden ratio, even though it appears to come from a distant area of mathematics and was found many, many, many years before this kind of algorithm was developed, is still fundamental in making it as efficient as it possibly can be. And that kind of connection between something that's very pure and very abstract and something that's applied is something that I think is one of the most fascinating things about maths. In that first section of the course, I was talking about the height y above the x-axis. And we had a graph like this. There was the y-axis pointing upwards, the 
x-axis pointing across and we had a graph with a maximum and a minimum point like this as we move from the left to the right. We're now going to introduce an extra dimension and we're going to have the x-axis moving across as before. We've got a y-axis that we now think of as pointing in to the screen and we've got a third axis, the z-axis, that points upwards like this. And instead of having a, a curve in space that gave us the height above the x-axis, we now have a two-dimensional surface that gives us the height z above the x-y plane. And surfaces are more difficult to represent, and one way of doing that is with the kind of contour plot that we have in the center. And in this plot, the higher regions are marked as lighter, they're colored in a lighter blue, and the lower regions are darker, as in the four corners and the outer regions of this plot. And I've also drawn lines that connect points of the same height, the same altitude, and that gives us these circles centered on the origin like this. And in this plot, we've got a clear maximum centered in the middle of the plot, where the plot is light blue, and then it goes darker blue as we move away from that maximum and fall away from it towards the edges of the picture. In this next slide, we've got a minimum, and this is plotted in a very, very similar way. Again, the minimum is centered at the center of this figure. It's located at the center of this figure, and we have this dark region in the middle. And as we move away from that dark region, and the altitude increases, we climb away from the center and we move to these lighter regions here. And again, I've marked points of the same height with these circles on this map, on this contour map. And that gives us the same kind of pattern that we had before, but because we've got a minimum instead of a maximum, we've got the dark region at the center instead of the light region at the center. Now, when we move on to the case of a two-dimensional surface rather than a single line, there's another possibility that didn't exist in that case. And this is called a saddle point. And to visualize a saddle point, we can think about starting at the bottom of this figure and gradually walking upwards. We start down in the bottom center like this and everything is dark. But as we look to either side, we can see that it starts to rise and we move to these lighter areas. As we walk towards the center here, then we start to climb and we start to move to lighter areas and we can still see still lighter areas as we look to the left and the right. So we're walking down a valley and until now we've been climbing. Once we reach the central region of the graph, then we start to fall and we start to move to darker regions like this, and eventually we reach the top of the graph. So we've been walking along a valley, but as we've been walking along that valley, we've initially been climbing, and we've then started to drop off as we move on the far side of the maximum, and we go to the end like this. And what this means is that if we look in this vertical direction here, this surface is going to look like a maximum. If we look in this horizontal direction, moving across the figure, then this surface is going to look like a minimum. And this combined maximum and minimum is usually referred to because it looks like a horse's saddle as a saddle point. Now, the contour plots that we've been using on these three slides are one way of representing these kinds of two-dimensional surfaces, and I'd like to give you a different one on the next slide now. Now it's more difficult to represent this kind of two-dimensional surface existing in a three-dimensional space in a flat two-dimensional figure, but it's possible to do that. One is with this kind of shaded figure here, and the other is with the previous slide. And if I start draw on this Pringle over on the left-hand side, I can think about moving in one direction and I start to drop and I start to rise again. If I walk in that direction only, then this surface looks like a minimum. I can think about walking in the other direction across the Pringle 
And in that case, I initially start to climb and then I start to drop on the other side as I move down here. I can do exactly the same thing in a slightly different color with this little platypus over on the right hand side here. If I draw along the bill of the little platypus, initially I'm dropping and then I start to rise over on the far side like this. If I draw across the bill of the platypus in the other direction, initially I'm rising and I then start to fall. If I go along the bill of the platypus, then it looks like a minimum. I fall initially and then I rise. If I move across the bill of the platypus, then I rise initially and then I start to fall. The title of this slide contains the word challenges. And the reason it contains the word challenges is because it's more difficult in many respects to find minimum and maximum points in higher dimensions than it is when we were dealing with the case of a height y above the x-axis as we were before. We can now think about a couple of reasons why that is. And to do that, we'll first go back to the kind of minimum that we had before. We've got the x-axis going across and the y-axis going up, and we're trying to find a minimum. And the way that we did that when we were working numerically was we'd worked out the value of y at three points like this. And when you've got the value of y at three points and the middle value lies below the outer two, then you know that the minimum is going to lie between these outer two points. We say that we bracketed the minimum. Now in higher dimensions with the surface, then that becomes impossible to do. If you've got a little side valley, then you've no longer bracketed the minimum. It can kind of escape from you. And once you bring things like saddle points into play as well, then it gets still more difficult. So the first difficulty in finding a minimum in higher dimensions or a maximum in higher dimensions is that it's not possible to bracket it in the same way that it was before. The second difficulty is the choice of the minimization or maximization direction. When we were thinking about finding a minimum of y as a function of x, we only had one possible direction in which to move. We could only move along the x-axis. But once we've moved into higher dimensions like this, we've got any number of directions that we could possibly move in. We could move vertically, horizontally, and along any diagonal that we could possibly want as well. The choice of directions becomes more and more difficult and it becomes critical to get that right for reasons, one of which I will illustrate now. And as an illustration of why it's important to get the direction of minimization right and choose it in an intelligent way, let's think about starting out at the bottom left-hand corner of this graph like this. And what we now do is we think about minimizing just along the y-axis. And we move upwards and it gets darker and darker and we stop once it starts to get lighter again and we've started to climb out of the minimum. We then allow ourselves only to minimize along the x-axis and we move to the right here like this. It gets darker. We're moving towards the minimum, at least in this direction. And then once it starts to get lighter again, then we stop because we've reached the little basin, at least in that direction. We then start to minimize in the y direction again. We keep on moving upwards. It gets darker and darker and darker. And we then stop once it starts to get lighter again. We then go back to minimizing in the x direction. And we move over to the right. We keep on going. It's getting darker. It's getting darker. Then once it starts to get lighter again, then we stop. Next, we go back to minimizing in the y direction to minimizing vertically. We move upwards like this, it gets darker. Once it's getting lighter again, we stop because we've found the minimum at least in that direction. We repeat the procedure going across, it's darker, 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 starting to get light again. And we continue until we've homed in on the minimum like this. And what you'll notice about having minimized along the X and the Y axes in this way is that we've not taken a very efficient path to the minimum of this particular surface. We've zigzagged like this, but it would have been much more logical to start at this point here and then move diagonally and get to the minimum in a smaller number of steps like this. 
The choice of minimization directions is one of the challenges when you're setting up a minimization problem involving a surface like this. The other big challenge in maximization and minimization and optimization is knowing whether you've found the global maximum, the highest point you can possibly get to, or the global minimum, the lowest point you can possibly get to. And as an illustration of this, I'll give you a brief sketch of a kind of problem that you often do in the very first term of university maths. And that will ask you to find the global maximum and the global minimum of a function along a closed interval like this, an interval along the x-axis that includes the endpoints like this. And when you have a function, a graph like this, defined on a closed interval of this kind, you've got various possibilities for the location of the global maximum and the global minimum. The global maximum, in this case, lies at this local maximum like this. It lies at the turning point that I've circled. But when you have a closed interval like this with the endpoints included, you've also got the possibility that the maximum, the minimum, the global maximum or the global minimum could lie at these endpoints as well. And that's the case here. We've got the global minimum lying over on the right at the rightmost end of the interval at this right dark circular point here. And there's no real nice way of locating those points other than working out the function at all the points where the global maximum and minimum could possibly lie, both the turning points and the endpoints, and then working out the value of the function at those. The global maximum and the global minimum is a property of the function as a whole, and you have to know something about the whole function in order to know whether you've got the global maximum or the global minimum. And that's what makes it generically a very difficult problem. And a lot of the cleverness, a lot of the research in optimization problems is in trying to find that global maximum or global minimum. And the kind of issue that's considered is let's think about having a graph that's got the shape I'm going to draw here. So it's got a minimum like this up at the top, but it's got a much deeper minimum down at the bottom over here. And the minimization algorithm of the kind that we had before could easily get itself stuck in what we call this local minimum over here on the left and not find this global minimum over here on the right. And a lot of research centers on ways of getting the algorithm, getting the computer program out of this local minimum here and down to the global minimum that you actually want to find over here on the right. The final concept that I want to introduce in connection with optimization is the idea of a constraint. And a constraint is a restriction on how far you can go when solving a minimization or maximization problem. And a classic example of a constraint is finding the shape that's formed by a chain when its two ends are fixed. You've got the left hand end fixed to this fence up here and then the right hand end fixed up here. And the physical problem that you're solving in this case is minimizing the gravitational potential energy of the chain. And you would minimize the gravitational potential energy of the chain by allowing the chain to fall. But there's a restriction on how far the chain can fall because the length of that chain is fixed. A chain is not something that stretches and its end-to-end -end distance and the end-to-end -end distance of a rope will be the same is fixed. And the problem that we solve here is minimizing the gravitational potential energy, but we don't do that completely freely. We do that under a constraint, and that constraint is that the length of this chain has to be fixed. To draw these concepts together, I'd like to talk about a third year project that one of our students completed a couple of years ago in collaboration with a local company. And the purpose of this project was to understand the maths behind the design of an electrical component called a waveguide. And a waveguide, as its name suggests, is something that guides electromagnetic radiation, particularly on the microwave frequency. And these things have got all kinds of applications in telecommunications. Now, what was being minimized in this case was the difference between the power transmission of the waveguide as it stands 
and the power transmission that the company wanted to get out of it. And what was varied in this case was the various dimensions of the waveguide that are marked over on this figure on the right. We had the overall length of the waveguide, we had the width of the waveguide, and we also had the dimensions of these small crosses that are marked in the centre here. And the mathematical problem that was being solved was to minimise the difference between the actual power transmission and the desired power transmission, and that minimisation was carried out by varying these different quantities in the diagram on the right, the dimensions of the waveguide and the dimensions of these small crosses within it. And exactly the same kinds of issues that we've spoken about through the earlier part of the talk came up as well. You've got constraints on this problem because you've got a certain amount of material that can be used and it has to fit into a certain other component as well. And you've also got the possibility of the algorithm that's finding these minimum points becoming stuck in local minima and not finding the global minimum as you would like it to do. And you've also got the idea of whether it's going as efficiently to that minimum as it possibly can and whether the algorithm is making its way through the landscape as efficiently as is possible. So although this is something that's quite practical and it appears quite distant from the way in which we introduced optimization, all of the basic ingredients of optimization are there. You've got something that's being minimized, you've got the variables, the quantities that are being changed in order to carry out that minimization, you have constraints, and you also have the issues of the algorithm getting stuck as well. What I hope I've shown in that talk is how some areas of maths that at first can appear quite abstract can have real practical applications, and I hope I've given you some idea of how optimization works and the various issues that are involved in an optimization problem. Thank you very much for listening. If you do have any questions, I'd be happy to take them, whether that's on the talk itself, on studying maths at university, or on careers in maths as well. And thank you again for listening. Thank you very much, Martin, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. I see that some questions were arriving in the Padlet. Uh, I, I just remind that uh, uh, everyone uh, can ask uh, in, uh, questions to Martin about talk <clears throat> uh, using either uh, live chat in YouTube uh, or a Padlet link, depends what you like. Uh, uh, in Padlet, it's uh, fully anonymous. And uh, um, a link to Padlet is also located. Uh, I just we just placed it in a, in a YouTube live chat. <clears throat> uh, I will uh, <clears throat> monitor these uh, two channels and uh, will uh, read uh, uh, <clears throat> questions to uh, Martin. Then uh, he will answer. Uh, so I uh, I see the uh, the question is. Um, uh, is there a lot of computer science involved here uh, or math? Um, I guess it involves aspects of both, really. Um, is there a lot of computer science involved or maths? Um, I guess you would have to do both. I mean, you would need some maths to understand why the algorithm was working, um, but you would need computer science in order to implement it. And computer science issues would come in, for example, as you were getting very close to a minimum and you were thinking about what the accuracy was and how far you could go in terms of calculating it. So it really is a mixture of the two. Understanding what's going on, you would need maths, definitely. But to implement it, you would need computer science as well. Uh, and uh, just uh, uh, that question was a bit continued further, the person typed, uh, if there is, uh, uh, do you have to learn a programming language uh, for uh, studying for math degree? Um, I think maths will involve a certain degree of computation, but it will be computing aimed at solving mathematical problems. 
if you look at um, jobs that involve maths now, then there will be a certain amount of computing involved. And if you do want to keep that involvement with mathematics, even in pure mathematics now, then a certain amount of computing is needed. I mean, you're still very much doing mathematics and you're using the computing as a tool in order to do that. But there will be a certain amount of computation involved. Yeah. Uh, and then there is question, um, uh, what made you interested in this specific field? Maybe interested in this specific field. I think I like the um, connection between doing maths and doing something that's relatively practical as well. Um, I think, as I mentioned in the talk, I like the fact that you can do something that started off really as being very, very abstract and people did it purely out of curiosity. And then a very, very long time later, you can think about um, that being applied in some kind of practical way. So I like mathematics. Why I do, I wouldn't be able to fully explain. It's something that I like, but I also like that um, motivation of it being applied to something as well. Right. Uh, I see there is, a, as you mentioned, applications. Uh, uh, there is a question, uh, why the opening in the wave guide is rectangular? Oh, crikey. Um, I'm trying to think of a waveguide I've seen that wasn't rectangular. Um, I guess I'd think of the question in terms of why it would be something else. And the waves traveling down a waveguide, they're going to have a kind of zigzag path with it bouncing off the opposing walls. Um, can I think of one that's not been rectangular? I don't really know. That's a very, very interesting question. And I'd, I'd think about it the other way around of what would happen if it were not rectangular. But what happens is you have a kind of total internal reflection. The wave would follow a zigzag path down the wave guide. Um, I suspect if it were not rectangular, that whole situation would become very much more complicated. OK, thank you. Uh, um, you mentioned golden ratio in the talk, and then there is a question just arrived. Uh, uh, what is your favorite application of a golden ratio? Favorite application of a golden ratio? Um, I guess it was probably that one. I guess it was probably that one if you want an application. But I mean, people claim kind of aesthetic values for it, don't they? Um, you see these kind of ideals of um, what the ideal face was down the ages. In the medieval time, it would divide into sevenths. And I think it was the Greeks had this kind of idea that it would obey the golden ratio. So people look at it and think that it has kind of aesthetic properties as well. But I'd, I'd probably say that my favourite one was the algorithm, I'm afraid. I'm a bit boring like that. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. And, and then there is a, a, a kind of related question. Uh, um, then you mentioned uh, uh, various application nature. Does the nature do optimization? I guess it must do in lots of ways. I mean, if you think about um, a given animal, uh, a given species of animal, that species of animal would have um, an optimum size. If you think about kind of doubling the height of a human and correspondingly doubling the width, then the weight of that human is going to grow correspondingly more than the cross-sectional area of the bones. And there are calculations that you can show about the kind of giants that appear in Jonathan Swift stories that they would break their legs every time they took a step. So I guess there's a kind of optimization problem going on there. Um, people talk as well about um, collective behavior of insects and so on in terms of optimization as well, um, or bees or ants finding the best route to a food source and things like that. So yes, I guess optimization in nature is happening all the time in different ways. So it, it seems uh, uh, for uh, writers of uh, science fiction stories, uh, knowing a little bit of mathematics is also could be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, there is another question. I'm just checking if there is any on YouTube. Uh, in Padlet, uh, how to find the correct direction to the minimum? It's probably related to your saddle. Uh, yes, yeah, that kind of zigzag shape. Um, you, there'd be a certain amount of trial and error to start with. Um, you would start with a set of directions along which you would try to minimize. And one strategy is to discard the most successful direction. So let's say we take the diagonal kind of minimum that I had there and we get incredibly lucky and we choose one of our directions as going diagonally upwards. 
once you've minimized along that direction, then you've really done everything that you can in that particular direction. So you tend to leave that one and then choose another set of directions from then on. So when you're first setting it up, there's a certain amount of trial and error, and you might start by minimizing along the axes. But from then on, you can take strategies like discarding a direction that's already been very successful, um, making sure that the directions are independent of each other and you're not repeating work and so on. So it's not it's not so much a case of choosing a very good direction to start with. It's refining your choice of directions as you progress through the problem. Uh, then I also uh, see there are two questions which look uh, uh, related. Uh, uh, one is, uh, are there any saddle points in high dimensions? And then there is question, um, can we find a minimum of many dimensions? Uh, yes, yes, all those concepts extend to high dimensions. Um, once you go above the case of the surface that I had, then they become very difficult to picture in your mind. But all those concepts exist in high dimensions. You can define a minimum in high dimensions. You can define a saddle point in high dimensions as well. Those di um, definitions do extend. But actually picturing them in your mind is something that's really a lot more difficult to do once you get above the number of dimensions I had. Right. Uh, um, uh, so if there are any more questions arriving. Just maybe a last question from uh, uh, myself. Uh, as you mentioned, this multiple directions. Uh, uh, so is, is it also that can be applied to optimizing uh, delivery, for instance, uh, uh, of goods uh, uh, to customers? Is it something uh, that mathematics helps as well? It does as well. I mean, there's a whole area of mathematics called um, operational research. Um, which is about solving that kind of problem. Um, the classic problems in that are things like um, fulfilling basic nutritional requirements as cheaply as you can. That's a standard problem in that kind of area. Um, maximizing profit, say making furniture, given that you've got a certain amount of time in the processing facility. So there's this whole area of maths that's called in the UK operational research or operations research in the US or one area of it is sometimes called linear programming, you may have come across, um, and that is um, a whole area that's connected with optimizing problems of that kind, making supply routes as efficient as possible and solving particular problems in terms of production or nutrition or whatever it might be. I just see just, uh, just one more question okay. arrived uh, uh, in Padlet. Um, could optimization be applied in astronomy? And if so, what fields could be useful in the most? In astronomy, um, I guess thing um, structures in astronomy and assembly of uh, the sol an assembly of the salt, like the solar system, for example, you'd be thinking about um, minimization of gravitational potential in terms of how it arranges itself. And finding that mathematically would be involve optimization, certainly. That's one area I could think of there. But we do have Phil coming now, who knows far more about this than I do. Yes, we, we have an astrophysics lecture after this one. I, I see one more question being typed, but uh, it's not yet completed. So <laughs> I don't see the suspense the full question. <laughs> It seems it seems disappeared from from Padlet. Oh no, not to worry. <laughs> Maybe uh, person, but uh, we still have uh, time if somebody wants uh, for uh, maybe last question uh, in a Padlet or in YouTube. Seems uh, seems not so. Um, I hope that uh, everything was uh, uh, very clear. Uh, and again, if you have uh, uh, any questions as to this uh, uh, talk uh, by Martin or uh, by uh, studying mathematics, uh, 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 then you can uh, uh, write email to Martin Greenall. Uh, so if you uh, scroll the video back to the beginning, uh, uh, Martin put his email address. 
Uh, oh, there is uh, another another question arrived in uh, YouTube. Would you be a disadvantage doing math at uni if you haven't got any experience with computing? No, no, you wouldn't, not at all. I mean, um, the computing courses at university start from the point of view that you don't have previous experience. So I think provided you know you're prepared to work at it and you're motivated to do it then I don't think that would be a disadvantage um, you would find it um, a little bit harder to start with but that's something that you can get over it's something that your lecturers will be taking into account and it's something that you could definitely get past yeah yeah I wouldn't worry about that at all and I, I just uh, uh, add to the computing that uh, uh, um, contrary to mathematics, which uh, has uh, thousands of years of development, uh, computing uh, and computing languages are much shorter uh, time. Uh, you know, they, they basically uh, go kind of to uh, to Victorian times, and that's it. Uh, so, what it means that computing languages itself, uh, they're very uh, recent developments. Uh, uh, some of them are just like of my age, uh, some much younger. Uh, you know, I don't remember, it could be some language which a bit older than me, but I think those languages are actually dead by now. Uh, so what it just means, you, if you, you know, you can learn those things anyway, because they knew, they appear, you, you cannot prepare yourself, uh, because maybe next year will be another language, uh, uh, but it all can be adjusted, and if you can learn math, uh, you also can learn uh, uh, computer languages, so I would not uh, worry about that. Okay, uh, we are well in time with our program. Uh, I would like to thank uh, um, uh, um, Martin Greenell uh, again, and just uh, uh, I think one of our students put an uh, uh, answer also in live chat. Uh, I didn't have much experience with computers in my first year, but now I'm in my fourth year master's and I feel comfortable using computing programs now. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, that was answer from our student, Stacey Kelly. Thank you very much, Stacey Kelly. Okay, uh, I'd like to wish you good afternoon. And if you uh, have time, please do join us uh, for next hour for our astrophysics lecture. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Martin, as well. Thank you very much for listening.